Hello, I'm Alex Rodriguez, your National Training Director for Chi Alpha Campus Ministries. Thank you again for joining us on Leading in a Pandemic, the video series. And thank you to Heather Erickson, Pete Bulette, James Jr., Jeff Mumley, and Weta Bradford for all of your teaching and all of your training. We feel so much more rich because of what you guys have shared with us. Thank you, Chi Alpha Nation, for tuning in once again. Today, we are talking about what is God saying and our guest is National Senior Director of Chi Alpha, Mr. E. Scott Martin. Scott, do you want to tell us what the E stands for, or do you want to keep it a mystery? It's a mystery. Some people know, but I will say this. It's a name that is coming back. It's oh, on comeback nice. right now. All right. So we don't know what the E stands for, but we do know it's rising. And today, Scott's going to talk to us about what is God saying. So we're going to go ahead and get in with it, because we know that your time is very valuable. Scott... Thank you so much for being here with us today. You've been serving as the National Senior Director for, I think, 63 months. Does that sound correct? It's been six years. Six years. April 1st, it was six years, and it has gone like that. So. I can only imagine. In these six years, I've only been with you for 18 months, but I've noticed that you have multiple jobs, from meeting with superintendents, to preaching sermons, to leading staff meetings, to solving problematic issues and personnel issues. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Out of all the responsibilities that the National Senior Director of Chi Alpha has, what is the most important job that you do? It's a good question. And, and I, again, just appreciate you, Alex. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. My pleasure. Your contribution to National Conference, our training director, is just fantastic. And we're so, so grateful. You know, uh, when I first became National Director, uh, Chi Alpha, we had been without a director for, for over a year. Uh, we'd just been through a lot of challenges as a ministry organization. We had some financial challenges. So when I came in, it was a pretty stressful time. There's a lot of stuff going, and we were just understanding we were going to have to lead some significant change. Mario Solari, our area director down in the southeast, gave me a call and just congratulating me, and we were in, talking a little bit. And he said, Scott, what is the most important thing the national director of Chi Alpha does? And I sat and thought about it for a minute, Alex. You know, there's so many components. You, know, you listed some of those. But so many components to this role that even after serving nationally, I didn't completely understand all of them. And just thinking through it all, I, I finally distilled it down to this. The most important role of the national director of Chi Alpha is hearing from God. Hmm. I mean, yes. bar none, hearing from God becomes the most important role of the National Director of Chi Alpha. So whoever follows me, I mean, that just means something that we have to really put as a hallmark of, of this role. It's hearing from God. And so I, I say the National Director of Chi Alpha is the CLO of Chi Alpha. Right. And so um, CLO is the Chief Listening Officer. Um, that means that I, you know, when you're leading change, we're talking about leading change in a pandemic. When we're leading change, it's, it's the ability to listen and to hear what people are saying. Yes. What's happening on the field? What are our campus missionaries struggling with? Right. What are they saying? What are the challenges out there? It's listening. It's listening to our leadership. What are they saying? What are their expectations? But it's listening to God as well yes. and hearing his spirit, knowing what the Lord is saying knowing his voice, and when we hear having the courage to lead in that direction. So, you know, when we're leading change, one of the most important things for leading change, especially in a pandemic, is listening. Listening to God and listening to the church, listening to Chi Alpha. The other thing a CLO is, is this, the chief learning officer, where it says this, uh, I'm, I'm always in personal learning. I'm always in pursuit of personal growth. Yeah. Spiritually, um, intellectually, in all capacities, I, I, I'm in pursuit of, of growth. And, you know, many people know right now I'm getting my doctor degree. I'm actually in my, really probably about my last quarter of my doctor degree right now. And that was all about learning. It was about growing. It was about making sure that I am a learner and that I'm setting a template for National Kaffa that says we are a learning organization. And, uh, I just encourage everybody, um, you need to be a CLO on your campus as well. Yes. You need to be the chief listening officer and the chief 
learning officer. Right on. I like how you said that, chief listening officer and chief learning officer, which of course implies that we have to listen in order to learn. I think it's brilliant. When you look at the world today, what exactly are you learning right now? Yeah, and I think, you know, looking at the world and just listening to God, start getting composites and things that really And I think the big thing is this, A-Rod, it's how quickly things can change. Sure. I think that in America, especially in our, our, our last three generations, we've been so stable. America has been so, so stable. You know, you think about this. We haven't suffered a major war. You might say, well, there's been Afghanistan, there's been Iraq and stuff. That didn't touch us here in America. Right. Okay, so that did, we've been very, very stable economically. We've been in a season of peace. We've not had any major financial crises. You know, we had some challenges in 2008, 2009, but we quickly overcame them. So how quickly things can change. In first week of March, I was with Mercer and uh, our older son, we were in Arizona skiing and fly fishing just spending a little bit of a personal time with him. He's going to be entering his third year of law school this year. So I just wanted to get some, some time with him during spring break. So we took a little time. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I mean, we heard a little rumbling of this little sickness. You know, no one's really over. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this global pandemic is declared. Sure. I didn't hear anybody. There was nobody I personally heard predicting or prophesying this. Right. And all of a sudden, it wasn't an epidemic, it was a pandemic. Things changed almost overnight, Alex. Um, we're up there, you know, fishing, enjoying ourselves. Awesome. We're like, you know, we, we better get back. He's on spring break. Gets a notice, spring break is going to be extended one week while we try to figure things out. Well, all of our campus missions are going to know that they were scrambling to get back from, from the spring break mission teams. Sure. All of a sudden, everybody else saying, we're extending our spring break as well. Just like that. Whoever gets another week of spring break added on. But it happened, and it happened all over the place. Yes. And it happened really, really quick. Next thing we know, almost overnight, all campuses, all campuses are shut down. What we had to be able to sit down like we are face to face with our students, it ended just like that. We had to be nimble. We had to think, okay, now what do we do? Everyone had to go online or on phone platforms. Um, and it happened quickly and it was unexpected. We were really not prepared for it because nobody had ever thought that. So I think one of the things that I sense the Lord saying is just how quickly things can change. We went from having the strongest economy in the world. Yes. To literally, within a month, there's this massive declination. I mean, the stock market, I want to say on February 12th, was at an all-time high of 29,500. March 20th, it was down to 19,200 around in there. Just a precipitous drop that happened so quickly. And I can tell you right now, people were panicking. I mean, there was, yes. because no one could have anticipated this. And I think one of the big lessons, one of the things that I'm, I'm hearing and I'm just sensing from God is how quickly things can change. Never get too comfortable. We sit down and we get comfortable and we always say, this cannot touch us. This cannot hurt us. And I'll tell you, as Americans, we're probably the worst at this. Because sure. we are so soft. We have had it so easy for so long in terms of, of luxuries, in terms of comfort, in terms of economy, in terms of surplus. We have had it for so long, and the church in America has had it for so long. And even Chi Alpha hmm. has had it for so long. There's a potential for us to get soft and to forget how quickly things can change. Right. And uh, so I'd say, Alex, that's probably one of the biggest things that I think has been stirring in me as I'm listening and as I'm learning. It's something I learned 
things can change overnight. Biblical illiteracy is alive and unwell in the church and in Chi Alpha today, causing us to believe things that we should not and not believe things that we should. So talk to me like I have never read a single verse necessary for teaching, correcting, training, and rebuking in righteousness. What exactly does the Bible say about financial collapse that you just mentioned? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it, it's very, very poignant in terms of, of what Scripture talks about. And one of the things is I spent two years just in Revelation and in Daniel. Things began to really rise up. You start pulling some things out when you're doing that depth of a study that you really start learning. And most of your theologians and uh, you know, our, our Bible teachers will all tell you that the representation of our economic systems in the Bible is... Uh, Babylon. And so, you know, there's times that, that the Old Testament is referencing Babylon in terms of the literal city, the literal mm -hmm. place. But when we look at Revelation, it's talking really about our, our economic systems. And in Revelation uh, chapter 18, there's a few references there that I'd bring up to say, if, if we want to look in again about how quickly things can change, how quickly things can shift right. in terms of our economic systems. People have put their trust in our, in our 403Bs, in, our, mm -hmm. in our, um, you know, all of our investments. We, we put our trust in our investment. We put our trust in the stock market. We put our trust in Social Security. I'm not necessarily saying that, that we should put our full trust in there. I mean, I put my hope. I hope yes. that it's still going to be there. I mean, I have hope. But I'm not pulling my full implicit trust in that. Revelation 18, 1 and 2. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his glory. And this is one of the interesting points I want to pull out of this. That this angel had, had great authority, but it was so immense, Alex, that its glory illuminated the entire earth. Wow. I mean, so the entire earth yeah. was illuminated That's by awesome. its presence. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. In other words, he's saying this the economic systems of the world have fallen, they've collapsed. Mm. It had been this vile, unclean place, the haunt of demons and spirits um, that have just worked through this economic system yes. and the results of that. Um, so verse 9 through 13, another interesting thing. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. In one hour your judgment has come. In other words, this thing collapsed like that. It wasn't this gradual economic decline. Right. It was something that was shocking. It was shocking. It caused grief and fear and lament and weeping because something catastrophic had happened to the global economic system. Alas, standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, I was at Gracie Babylon. It's on for one hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn for her. No one buys their merchandise anymore. Amazon, sorry, bud. No one's buying, man. Merchandise. And here... John begins to list merchandise of his day, but it's a representation of all the merchandise that moves and sells globally in today's economy. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object, most precious wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, incense, Fragrant oil, frankincense, wine, oil. He goes really into agricultural commodities. It's interesting, he breaks it down in terms of commodities. Right. And he says, wine and oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, 
and sheep and horses, chariots and bodies and souls of men. And that's a part, Alex, that most people miss on this. That what was being brokered on the economic system, it was also the bodies and the souls of human beings. The people were selling themselves out. And, and the slavery, he's talking, this is sex slavery, this is sure. sex trafficking, all those things. It is literal slavery, but also the selling out of a person's soul mm. that could be sold on market for money in the economy. Last little scripture with that comes in verse 17 and again. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster who traveled by ship, sailors as many who trade on the sea, stood at a distance. In other words, all of our ports, everything becomes vacant. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning and said, what is like this great city? But again, it was in one hour, Alex. Things literally collapse in a single hour. And uh, I think that we need to be prepared to not put our trust in the things of this world, not put our trust in the come of things of the day. I think that this is something that God is saying to us. What is God saying in a pandemic? You better not put your trust just in this, even just your trust in medicine. Look, we have good friends who suffered greatly from COVID. Um, we know Greg Mundus was on, he was on his deathbed. He was given no chance of survival. The doctor said he will die tonight, and everyone just needs to prepare themselves for that. I mean, he, he wasn't given, it's not going to happen. But I'll tell you, the prayers of thousands and thousands and thousands of yeah. saints around the world began to bombard heaven. And yes, we're grateful for medicine. I have a brother-in-law who's a medical doctor. We're grateful for medicine. We're grateful for the innovations that our science is continuing to produce. We're grateful for that. We're grateful, um, you know, for the ventilators and other things. But at the end of the day, that is not what saved him. It was the prayers of the saints that saved that man. We cannot put our trust solely in the systems of this world. We can put some hope in that. Well, I sure hope this works, you know? You know what I'm saying? I mean, oh, if sure. I get COVID and God didn't heal me immediately, I sure hope it's going to work, you know? I hope this works. But my trust is in the Lord. Yes. And no matter what my fate, my trust is in the Lord. Now, here's something else when we're talking just, you know, biblically and that bigger thing, what is God saying when we're leading a pandemic is this. Jesus... Jesus said there would be pestilences that would come in the end days. And I think this is just the beginning of some things again. CDC, the Center for you know, Disease Control in the United States, is saying this winter could be one of the most challenging in terms of, of illness that America has ever ever seen before because of COVID. And that's what they're saying. Our trust is in the Lord. But Jesus said this. He said in Matthew 24, the disciples came and tell us when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered, see that no one leads you astray. For many will come, you know, they'll, I'm the Christ. He says, don't be alarmed. But here's the point. For nation will rise up against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes pestilences in various places. All these things are the beginning of birth pains. Right. So I think for someone who doesn't know in terms of biblical literacy, Jesus said all these things would happen. Yes. But I think we're just at the, the nascent stages of things. They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. I never start this in my discipleship. And then many will fall away and betray one another, and hate one another. Now, I believe there will be a, a significant falling away. Jesus says it will happen. People will turn on each other. Um, false teachers will rise up. Lawlessness. Lawlessness will be increased. People 
disregarding the laws and doing whatever they want. This will be increased. Anarchy, lawlessness, anarchy is increased. And the love of many will go cold. But those who endure till the end, they're the ones who are going to be saved. And I think that one of the biggest things that we need to understand is that we have to be prepared to endure until the end. Sure. And when Jesus goes on, he says, hey, this thing gets so intense. If it, if it wasn't for the elect's sake, no one's going to be saved. Well, I'm, these days will be shortened, but for the elect's sake. And so Jesus said there's going to be very, very challenging days. And I think that for the biblically illiterate in terms of how do we lead in a pandemic when there's a lot of change, just understanding. Jesus talked about all of this. Sure. Jesus had talked about all of this, how quickly things can change just in a single hour. I think it's helpful to know what the Bible says. So often in Chi Alpha, a lot of the uh, pushback that we receive from staff, from students perhaps, uh, both really, uh, I don't like Chi Alpha. They asked me to go out and make disciples. Well, actually, it's Jesus who says, go out and make disciples of all nations. I don't like Chi Alpha. They asked me to raise money, go on mission trips, and so on and so forth. Well, actually, it's Jesus who says, be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. I don't like what I'm hearing from Scott Martin today, talking about financial collapse and tribulation and so on and so forth. Many will be offended. Many will grow. Well, actually, it's Jesus who's preaching. Thank you. I'm not saying What's that. What's happening? Today. I just want to go on record. I wish everything would just continue to prosper and be happily ever after. That will be wonderful. That's what I want. I want my 403B to, to grow. I want to be able to retire with a whole lot of money and live happily ever after. That's what I want. Yes. That's the flesh. That's what I want. But when I look at biblical literacy, Scripture says as we get close to the end days, it just may not be that way. We need to be prepared for change. Going back to what the Bible says. Ephesians 6 mentions that we battle against flesh and blood, which we do see. But specifically, more realistically, we battle against principalities, which we do not see. So tell us, what do you see happening in the realm of earthly power and spiritual power? Yeah, I appreciate that. And again, I, I'm not trying to be an alarmist. I'm trying to be a biblical pragmatist in here. Really, what is God saying to us and preparing us uh, just to think much, much deeper because things have radically changed. They changed quickly. I anticipate more change. So, yeah, Scripture says in Ephesians 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against spirit and principalities, rulers of darkness and wickedness in, in high places. An interesting thing, A-Rod, that word, the King James Version uses, some versions we use the word, are, we do not fight, um, battle. King James Version uses the word wrestle. It's the word pele. I mean, the original word is the word pele. And, and it's probably best interpreted as wrestle, and it's really used in the form of Greco-Roman wrestling. Sure. Constant contact. You know, it's like when you're fighting, I might be able to box, I might be able to throw a few jabs and back away. When it's wrestling, you're all in. There's constant contact. Basically, that's, that's what the context is. It's, it's about, you're in a continual contact with the spirit realm. I think the thing is that we need to understand that there is a reality of the spirit realm that we interact with every day. We cannot become so secularized and get so good at just our teachings, we know our answers. And, you know, man, I am greatly appreciative of apologetics. I said, I'm a scientist by education. I understand that. Be ready to give an answer to anyone asks us the hope that lies within you with meekness and with fear. We have an obligation to be able to study and do well. That's why we're the CLO, Chief Learning Officers, because we continue to learn. We want to be able to answer credibly, we want to be credible witnesses on the secular university, but also with an understanding that there is a spiritual battle that is going on all the time, and we can never be ignorant of that. We can never be ignorant of spiritual forces that are going on. One of the things that I've learned as I've listened and read is the immensity of the spirit realm. Sure. You know, just as, as we talked about in Revelation chapter 18, the one angel comes up, just his glory illuminates the whole earth. You see other areas that, that this thing is big. It's not some little, small, little, I think we have these little imps running around. But the devil's out to steal, kill, and to destroy. And I mean completely annihilate and to destroy. And so there are spiritual powers and spiritual forces at work at all time. And the second thing is that there's all the earthly powers at work. And earthly powers can be manipulated by spiritual powers as well. And even in our political climate and the political system that we're dealing with today and here in America, 
There are earthly powers at work on all sides that are jockeying for control. The lust for power. Sure. The lust for control. Um, the lust for money. All those things. Control, power, and money. Um, earthly systems that are, are at work and where people are continually jockeying for power. It cannot be so with us. And yes. um, you know, I've said one of the greatest challenges of the disciples was that of ambition. Mm. And let me say personal ambition. We need to have ambition for the kingdom of God to do everything we can to advance his kingdom and yes. advance his will. But it can never be about us. I want power, but I want spiritual kingdom power and kingdom authority in alignment with his will to make him look good, not me. Right. I must be small. He must be large. It's yes. the antithesis of what today's um, brokerage house of power is, mm. earthly power. And uh, there's spiritual forces that work, spiritual power, but what I do know is as greater is he that's in you, greater is he that's in me, than he that's in all that's these right. other forces. And so as we continue to walk as spirit-empowered people, with the humility, with the kingdom humility in pursuit of the authentic gospel, no matter what we face in a pandemic, we're going to be okay. Going back to being a chief listening officer and a chief learning officer, have you been listening to other people of God to hear what God is saying to them? Absolutely. And I think an important thing, when things started unraveling, you know, there were questions about, you know, the uh-oh moments. In America, things changing overnight, A-Rod, Place in America became, became a ghost town. It was eerie. I think everybody knows our campuses that were just buzzing, you know, two weeks earlier was just buzzing with people and activity become a ghost town, completely shut down. Cities, New York, completely shut down. It was eerie. And as I was seeking the Lord, I began to, uh, I, I asked the question, okay, what are our prophets saying? What are people with prophetic gifting saying? I began to connect with some of our people in Chi Alpha and just asking, are you sensing anything from the Lord? And even when we were planning these, that was a question that was in there. Is God saying anything to you? Sure. Are you hearing anything from God? Um, Dick and Joy Schroeder and I had a 45-minute talk in April, early April, just about... What, what are you guys sensing God is saying? And I wanted to share just something that they brought out. And Isaiah 2, 12 says this, For the Lord of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. And I want to share something that, that they had said. They said the coronavirus is precipitating a day of reckoning, not only for America, but for the whole earth. The illusion of prosperity through debt is being unmasked. Everything that can be shaken is being shaken. And I want to go to this. That phrase, everything that can be shaken is being shaken, is exactly what I sense the Lord say to me. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And right. I want to say that as I felt the Lord speaking. Government corruption and ineptness will be more clearly seen than ever before. That which is done in secret will be increasingly disclosed publicly. Personal shortcomings are being exposed due to the, necessi due to the necessary restrictions imposed by the virus. And so that was some input that they had. I thought, boy, there's some things that the Lord has spoken to me very directly about as well. Um, and so whatever can be shaken will be shaken. So yeah, part of listening, listening to what others are saying. I've tried to take a lot of what, what others have said and what I've been hearing from the Lord and what right. Jesus said yes. and what Jesus said to help us formulate how do you lead change in a pandemic. We have talked of many mystical things in this conversation, but we believe according to the Bible and apostles and history that a good missionary is also mystical and methodical. So practically speaking, what do we need to be doing and what do we not need to be doing right now? Yeah, that, that, that's really, really good. As human beings, we were created for work. And um, anything outside of rest and leisure is really defined as work. Sure. And I'd say the first thing is, in we need to be working. 
We need to be working to advance the kingdom of God. We need to be working to disciple university students, no matter what context we find ourselves in. You know, we've talked about the different scenarios that are out there. They're still changing constantly. I mean, there's a big chance we may not have football this year, okay? Things are constantly changing. Right. They are shifting. But understanding, in the midst of all of this, we're still called to make disciples. And God still has a significant plan for us, no matter what scenario we find ourselves on on our campus. So here's some practical things I'd say, Alex. I'd say that no matter what state your campus is in, and we know none of them are going to be like they were in February of this year. Sure. So no matter what state you find in it, work. That might be let's prayer walk that camp. If your campus is completely shut down and you have very limited access to students, then get on campus and begin to prayer walk that campus, begin to intercede for students, but work for the kingdom, right. work in the heavenlies, intercede, pray, prayer walks. Um, you know, pray, pray for your state, pray for the nation, pray for the world, pray for your students, but get on campus. The power of presence on campus can break a lot of things. Yes. I'd say this too. Take this time to study. Take this time to learn. Take this time to prepare new messages. Take this time to hear what God might be saying to you and how you lead your ministry. Um, I'd say the, the third thing is don't just sit around but connect with students. I mean, I would give every single one of my students a call as free. Hey, how are you doing? Just the check-in, making sure that the students are covered. Um, and that's assuming that you may be in a worst-case scenario. But you got to continue to have contact and connection with all of our students. We can't let that lag. And so I challenge all of our missionaries out there. Man, if, if during the season you've not had connection with students, we got to get on that. That's leading in a pandemic. It's continuing to have contact with our students and disciples. Um, use this time to develop relationship with administration on the campus. Mm. You know, this could be a remarkable season to be able to go in and meet with the president of the university. This might be a remarkable sure. season to sit down with dean of students and say, how can I serve you? What can we do to help make things better for you and your role? How can we serve you? This is an excellent time to make those relationships. Now, I think right now, these people are more open than ever before sure. for interaction with Chi Alpha and how we might be able to serve. And I think when we go in with that posture of how can we serve, I believe it can open up remarkable doors so that when day opens and we are back on campus, that there's opportunity for us in greater measures and we've we've had in a long time. Let me say some things don't do. Don't sit around and binge watch Netflix, okay? You can do it on your Saturday or whatever, but it can't be four hours a day I'm sitting around watching Netflix. Right. We got to get up and work for the kingdom. These are critical, critical times. Yes. You know, don't just hang around in your PJs. Get up, get dressed, get to work. It was, you know, when we went into complete lockdown here, Alex. And again, we don't know what's going to happen in, in the winter months. But I can tell you, um, most, most ep medical people are saying they're anticipating some pretty serious thing. And they would not be surprised if there was uh, another lockdown. I'm not predicting that. Neither am I prophesying that. But I'm saying when things happen like that, in the mornings, get up, get dressed, sure. pray, seek the Lord. Um, but don't just sit around in our pajamas yes. during the day. Get up and be productive, okay? I said this, but don't put your trust in the systems of the world in terms of, of health and finance. I think that's a very pragmatic thing. Of course we use the banks. Of course we seek medical professionals. Right. Yes, yes, we do that. But they're not the ultimate authority. Right. God is the ultimate authority. So sometimes we hear so much doom and gloom on, on the media and stuff. My thing is, God's will supersedes any of that. And we have to stick with that. So pragmatically, we need to continue to be discipling our university students. So before 
during and after the pandemic, the hero of Chi Alpha is still the small group leader who can disciple more small group leaders, who can disciple more small group leaders. So when it comes to the discipleship, what do we need to be focusing on right now? Yeah, I, I think that as we come into some of the hardest times that we faced, and if we do have some economic challenges that push us here in America, um, you know, I think that there's a few things that we need to focus on. One is just a covenantal commitment to Christ and his followers. What I'm saying that is that it's not just this casual commitment. It's this, I'm all in for you, Alex. I mean, I, I'm all in for you and with you, and I will do whatever it takes as a brother and Lord to be able to advance and to live right, and to, pro, and, and to be healthy. I'm going to do whatever. That's that covenantal commitment to Christ and his followers. And we have to be teaching and discipling our, our students that this isn't just about a fun little gathering. This is about we're all in. That's right. We're all in with each other. We're all in with the kingdom. But we've got to dig into um, not just a surface discipleship, but a deep, deep discipleship that isn't just about our fun and fellowship. And I love that, man. I mean, I love to get together and have fun and laugh. And, and um, But it, it's, it's an understanding that we're in this thing all the way. I think the second thing is a discipleship. Like I said, all the way. A disciple that, that's committed all the way to the cross. You know, Jesus said you need to take up your cross. He didn't say you have to take up his cross. So you have to take up your own cross. In other words, everybody has a cross to bear that representation of things that might be challenging in life as we're moving the kingdom forward. And we have to prepare and teach our disciples, our students, um, the power of taking up their cross and following him. Um, Persecution could very, very well increase it's in levels that we've never we've not been persecuted here in America really. I mean we've had a few pushbacks in terms of religious liberties and that kind of stuff. Frankly, that's not the persecution that Jesus talks about, a persecution that is so intense that if it wasn't short, no one would be saved and that the love of many will grow cold. We've got to teach our disciples that man, you're all in and we love Jesus and we leave each and we love each other and we're committed to you. Right. to do everything we can that we can move um, Christ's kingdom on the campus to where he wants it to be. I, I think another thing we need to disciple and something we all need to be aware of is missionaries. You know, there, there may be a time we need to live a little leaner than mm-hmm. what we are. Um, America is used to instantaneous gratification. Sure. You want something, go buy it on Amazon, I'll put it on my card, Okay. Um, we're, we're used to instantaneous gratification. You know, if you got to wait more than three lines at McDonald's, you're ticked off. You know, why would I have to do that? It's instantaneous gratification. And we have to train our disciples. And all of us as missionaries need to understand that maybe did we have to live a little leaner. Um, it can't be the thing of, of instantaneous gratification anymore. That we're going to have to save and maybe not get, the, maybe still drive the car that has 200,000 miles on it. Sure. You know, we may still be wearing our, our jeans from five years ago. You know, we may still need to be wearing our shoes from eight years ago. And I know that might sound, sound Debbie Downer, but the begin, I mean, I, I feel like we need to be processing. There may be a season that we have to be living mm. leaner. And uh, the other thing is this. I think we have to disciple into our students in this season is no matter what happens, we have to really be, be giving and sharing. Right. I think that's a very important thing. When you're leading a pandemic, it gets down to the issue of giving and sharing. You know, most of our ministries, their income did not really decrease over this time. I'm going to tell you why. Because there were people who were so committed, who still had jobs, who said, I'm going to have to up it. I can tell you, and this is anything boastful, but Chris and I have given more to missions in, the, in those first few months than we ever had because we said if there's ever a time people need it, it is now. Sure. Many of my friends who are pastors said their church giving actually has gone up. Wow. It didn't decline it, during the COVID that's pandemic. Okay, it's, But that's because people took the responsibility of giving and sharing. I think it's something we're going to have to teach very strong. 
that as we move forward, I think we do a good job with that, but as we go forward, continue to disciple the thing of it's all the Lord's. And if, if we do have challenges with the pandemic and people are in lockdown, they're able to give and share. Let me end this little, just quick, and I want one more question in this. We served in, in Kyrgyzstan together. Yes. Um, I saw a video come out from Kyrgyzstan and it was a woman saying, we're starving. We are dying. Our people are dying. We're starving in lockdown. They were locked down. Nobody could, and nobody could get food. Well, you know what? There are people who in America, I know personally people in America, I knew international students who felt like they couldn't go out and they were almost starving in their apartments. We have to be willing to cover our people and to share and to give with the people of the kingdom and with our neighbors. No, that makes sense. I've been uh, reading through Acts, and of course it says they had all things in common. They gave to anyone who had need. Mr. Morgan describes that phrase, all things in common, as fellowship means what is mine is at your disposal, and what is yours is at my disposal. Yeah. And if that becomes the disposition of us all, no one will be in need. Yeah. Thank you, Scott, so much for your time, and thank you, Kyle Alpha Nation, for being with us. We have one final question to land this plane. In the uh, spirit of our Campus Ministry podcast friends, um, what exactly is your last 10% to say to the missionary out there who wants to entrust the gospel to reliable people able to teach others also, but is suffering through all the uncertainty that, two ta- that 2020 has brought? Yeah, that, that's great. I think, one, again, just going to Jesus, you got to eliminate worry. And it was hard to do. But it's a posture we have to take, a posture that says, I'm going to live in the Sabbath rest of the Lord. I will not worry. God is my supply. Yes. And I, as I'm submitted to him as his child, um, I put my trust in him. I put my trust in him. So I think one is we cannot worry. I think two is we cannot panic. As spiritual leaders, as men and women of God, as missionaries, as all of our Chi Alphans are as missionaries, I don't care if you're CMIT, if you are a missionary associate, if you're a career missionary associate, um, if you're now, whatever your appointment is, we're missionaries. We cannot panic no matter what happens. That's right. If the whole thing falls apart, do you know what Jesus said to do? Lift up your head and rejoice. Because your redemption draws nigh. If the whole thing unravels, lift your head and rejoice. Your redemption draws nigh. Right on. But we cannot panic in a pandemic. Mm. We lead spiritually and hear from God and, and, and trust Him and read His Word. And we work and we understand that there are spiritual forces happening. But we have this prescience and understanding. But we do not panic. We don't worry. We don't panic. I think those are two very, very important things for us when we're leading a pandemic. If you're going to lead in a pandemic, those are two things you can't be doing. It doesn't mean we don't have concerns. Okay, it doesn't mean we don't have concerns. It doesn't even mean that there can't be a healthy fear that could actually emerge at a point. Fear is something that God gives to us, Alex. It's a self-preservation thing. But when it gets out of control, it becomes unhealthy. You know, you know, uh-oh. It's those uh-oh moments. You can have an uh-oh moment, but you got to put that in in alignment with Scripture and with the Spirit of the Lord very, very quick. We can't fear. We can't panic. We're not going to worry. Okay? And I'd say this, and you, everybody knows this, but, man, the Lord said we're about ready to witness the greatest student awakening in history. How That's does right. all this play into awakening on our campus? My campus is closed. Well, I believe right now that there are people who they might be fearful, they might be panicked, they might be worrying, but as a people of God go in with the truth of God, even in a season of persecution, even in, in a season that could be hard on us, that she go in with the message of Christ, I think there are people more open today than ever before. If the love of many may grow cold, but there's a lot of them out there. They're looking for truth. Right they on. are looking for Jesus. Let it be. And we need to continue to plant the flag of Christ on campus to hoist that thing high where people can see it, that you become the living flag of Christ on campus. Something I've been sharing with our missionaries as we're interviewing them is this, A-Rod, that we need to be the incense bearers of Christ. Everywhere we go, we are bringing the presence of the power and the kingdom of God 
everywhere we're going. If I'm saying one thing to our ministries, you want to know how to lead in the pandemic, you bring the presence and the power of God everywhere you go. That's right. You bring the voice and the words of God everywhere you go. And students are still coming to Christ. Students are still hungry for Christ. Students will still be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And when the nation's open, we're be, going to be sending missionaries there. And if the nation's never opened again, we're still going to be praying and interceding and giving and doing everything we can yes. to extend the kingdom of God and plant the flag of Christ. I think this is one of the greatest days in the history of the church to be alive. I really, really do. I believe that. And I believe it's a great, great day to be in campus ministry. Challenging, yes, but great. And I think as we've listened to all the different scenarios and how we can continue to move forward, um, God's going to do some great, great things. Right on. Thank you, Scott, so much for being with us. And thank you, Chi Alpha Nation, for tuning into this series. May God bless you. May He keep you. May He cause you to be fruitful. Let's go reconcile students to Christ. <laughs>